So these are my conclusions on the most common arguments that we have uh, looked at. And I've numbered these conclusions because if there is anybody that's going to ask uh, any questions after this huge amount of time, um, I think it would probably be easier for people if you can object to one of my uh, conclusions by number. And then I can bring it up on the screen and see exactly uh, what you're objecting with. So my first conclusion is that angels interbred with the daughters of men who bore children to them. These children were the Nephilim, the giants, uh, the Rephaim. So the son of Seth theory uh, has no credibility in my eyes, and it's certainly not a reason to cast out the book of Enoch as possible scripture. While it may not be true that the book of Enoch categorically states that Enoch is the son of man and will judge the world, it is true that R.H. Charles translated the reference to Enoch in the third person instead of the second, and that when the phrase son of man is used in the second person, it directly follows, i.e. you, Enoch, it directly follows the section that describes the elect one, and it absolutely does say that the righteous will follow Enoch's ways and a whole ton of other things that have previously been ascribed to the Son of Man that has been described. So it certainly reads to me as this conclusion, which then says, there you go, Enoch, it's you. That's how it reads to me. And remember, these conclusions are subjective. I've looked at these things objectively to see if there is any truth to the evidence that is presented. And I've presented the evidence to you and I've examined it and you can come to your own conclusions. These are not things that I'm telling you to believe. They are my subjective conclusions. Three, Josephus' comments about the 22 books are certainly not universally recognized as detailing a Jewish canon. And even if they were, it would be no more valid an argument than, that the fact, than the fact that other groups of Christians and Jews did canonize it. So using Josephus is no better than using any other group. They're just men. And they came to their conclusions through the reasonings of men. Verse four, the book of Enoch has not been evidenced to be scripture and has real issues that call me great, cause me grave concern. Real things that we would have to address before even touching the book of Enoch as potentially um, inspired because we've got to be so uh, precious over what we call the words of Elohim. So as to whether the book of Enoch is not scripture, all I can say is the book of Enoch's never been evidenced to be scripture. Again, we've gathered this huge collection of arguments as to why it should be scripture and then when we look at what's left, there's nothing of any kind of substance there, just a whole load of misunderstandings or misinterpretations of scripture, things that people have gotten wrong to uh, come to the conclusion that these are actually reasons or arguments to include it as scripture. The giants in the Bible, <coughs> excuse me, the giants in the Bible are exclusively described as very great, mighty, and tall men. Believing the book of Enoch means that we must modify our understanding to reflect this outside source. So if we believe Enoch, then we have a lot of stuff in the Bible that we need to understand differently. It's a, a, a doctrinal reformation. And if it was proven to be scripture or that there was any evidence that it should be considered in such a way, with me, that would be fine. I'd just say, wow, there's a whole load of things that we need to change. However, without the evidence that it's scripture or that it's valid or that it's accurate in any way, then this is incredibly troubling that some people are willing to do this. To me, it's just kicking the word of Elohim to the curb and saying, I like this book. I'm going to believe this. But people don't do that. They have reasoned arguments for why the book of Enoch is scripture, which is why I wanted to objectively look at them and say, maybe I've been wrong. I'm going to reset what I think and look at this objectively, which is what I've tried to do. The book of Enoch has been a favorite of occultists, atheists, and new ages, and of anyone 
who is more interested in fantastic stories rather than their personal sin, righteousness, and judgment. But that's neither here nor there as regards its validity. And when I say anyone who is more interested in these things, I'm not saying that anyone who reads the Book of Enoch or is interested by it is more interested in fantastic stories, but you can pick any group of people who aren't interested in truth, aren't interested in sin, judgment, and righteousness, but are interested in fantastic stories, and they all love the Book of Enoch. The New Testament, as well as other scripture, is commonly viewed as being in agreement with Enoch. But this can be seen in different lights. Some see it as proving that the authors of scripture had knowledge of Enoch, since none of their statements are definitely taken from the the book of Enoch. There is much reason to doubt this. It cannot be categorically proven either way, but the misunderstandings do show that these claims are not true. And when I use the word true, I'm talking about something that is absolutely universally true. We cannot prove that these things came from Enoch. Jude and Peter write about similar things, but they write about a whole load of other things that they're in agreement with that aren't in Enoch, which would suggest to me at least that there is another source and that maybe Jude, Peter, and Enoch are all drawing from that more ancient source. We saw Julius Africanus when he talked about if we are to accept angels coming down into breathing with the sons of, uh, with the daughters of men, We also have to accept all of this other stuff. And none of that stuff was in Enoch, but what Enoch wrote of was similar enough to it thematically to suggest that maybe Enoch was also drawing from an earlier source or earlier ideas. But absolutely, in no way were the authors of the New Testament um, definitively drawing from Enoch. They talk about some similar things. Jude's passage is remarkably similar, and the fact that he says that it was Enoch that prophesied it is compelling. But doctrinally, it is different, and we don't know that Jude and Enoch weren't drawing from the same source. Enoch, in fact, appears to be drawing from Scripture because the things that it says are written in Scripture, whereas the things that Jude says also written in scripture, are not reflective of what Enoch says precisely. When Jude says Enoch prophesied of these things, we hear many authors of scripture saying that somebody has prophesied something or somebody has said something that they didn't have to have former textual knowledge of. The example being again in Jude again when he says um, that Michael contended with Satan over the body of Moses, and then he said, Yehovah rebuke you. He's making a statement that he doesn't have any former textual knowledge of. He doesn't have to have a book that has told him those things for him to write under the inspiration of the Ruach. The argument is not a sound argument, but I would suggest watching that section uh, of the video again if you want it uh, laid out in more detail. We do not know whether Peter and Jude are referring to Enoch or whether Peter, Jude, and Enoch are all referring to an earlier text or concept. So to suggest one or the other as fact is deceptive. To say Jude and Peter are referring to the book of Enoch is is deceptive. To say Jude and Peter are not referring to the book of Enoch is deceptive because we do not have any way of categorically proving it. Equally, though, we have no reason to believe that Peter and Jude must be drawing from the book of Enoch. That is not a logical argument. The most that could be said is that Enoch speaks of the same things. If you want to speak factually about the matter, that's the most that could be said. So this isn't a new point. This is part of point seven about the New Testament. The corruption of all flesh in context, appears to be limited to the idea that all flesh worked wickedness. Noah's perfection also appears to be moral in nature. There is no reason to automatically assume otherwise. It is creative use of Strong's concordance, which might make you think, 
words that don't have that meaning mean that thing when you just take them back to the root word rather than the modified word. Moses writes about matters that the book of Enoch expounds on, okay, with the Nephilim. The book of Enoch writes about those things and it expounds on them and gives us loads of detail. However, we don't need all of that detail. The idea that we must have that detail or that it must have come from an earlier source just isn't borne out by what we observe in the rest of the Bible. Whether Enoch's exposition was pre or post Moses is not provable. I can't prove that it was post Moses. I can't prove that it was pre Moses. But the claim that it must have been pre is not founded on proper logic. It's not a logical argument. Yeshua is speaking about concepts that are found in the Bible. When he says that the woman would not be any of the men's wife and that we will all be as the angels of, in uh, heaven in the resurrection, it is not an understanding only found in Enoch and is actually contradicted by Enoch if we try to combine the two statements. And he's talking about the things that we accept as scripture. We can understand his words from those things. Biblical giants bear no resemblance to the pagan legends of Titans, but the angels certainly do. This does not logically mean that Enoch has validity because it agrees with mythology. Neither does it mean that it is to be rejected for that reason. Neither argument is provable. Okay, again, as we're sifting through what is left of these arguments, there is just nothing that recommends Enoch as scripture. The thing which has recommended it to people's uh, hearts in the past is that it contains information that they find interesting. The translator of the book of Jasher, the original translator, said he believes it to be scripture because it has such interesting information in. But information can be interesting and yet not true. So to conflate the two is a serious mistake. Just because it's got all of this information about uh, the pre-flood world doesn't mean that information's accurate. And if it's not accurate, it's worthless. It is claimed that Enoch wrote the book of Enoch, but it does not appear to be possible to prove it either way. The burden of proof to anyone making the claim that it was written by Enoch would rest on them. And the same is true of anyone denying it. You say the book of Enoch's written by Enoch, say prove it. Say the book of Enoch's not written by Enoch, say prove it. The idea that the prophecies of Yeshua were the reason why the Jews wanted to distance themselves from the book of Enoch is commonly represented to be the theory being advocated by Tertullian, but he was actually saying that it was the reason that the Jews had never accepted it. But either way, it's irrelevant as to an argument for accepting it as scripture. The book of Enoch absolutely was canonized by some groups of Jews and Christians, just as today some believed it and some don't. The overwhelming majority did not believe that it was inspired. Small fragments of an Aramaic copy of the book of Enoch were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls along with other works which advocated divination, fortune telling using lightning as your indicator, the Qumran community were not permitted to destroy anything with Yehovah, um, with the name Yehovah inscribed upon it. So the fact that they retained it was simply, um, could simply have been because it had its name on it rather than them ascribing any kind of authenticity to it. The early church fathers called the book of Enoch scripture, but they also believed a large portion of false and even heretical doctrine, which I think is well evidenced simply by reading the things uh, that they wrote rather than just hearing. The early church fathers uh, believed it to be scripture and then taking that argument without um, examining it, which is why uh, I felt it was important to examine that particular one. Enoch was not in any version of the King James Version, but it was rejected by the later church. Ideas that this was conspiratorial or because of the Catholic Church can only be upheld by those without specific knowledge as to the events. Because if you read the things that they actually said, they're not taking these books out. <coughs> these uh, councils um, 
had completely different rationale than to what is uh, represented by people. So it's only if you are completely ignorant to what actually happened uh, that you could hold that belief. And it's fair enough if someone tells you that that was uh, why, and it sounds like a reasonable reason to you and you um, accept it, that's fair enough. But with anything like that, you have to examine the historicity of it. You have to examine whether or not it actually has validity in reality rather than conceptually as something that could be true. Uh, number 17, the Book of Enoch's cosmology reflects a common belief of the time and astronomical observations contained within it are meticulous but also rely on an unproven and unbiblical understanding of the heavens. So the things about the gates and the, you know, the portals that these things enter into, it's not in the Bible anywhere. And as to what it says about the earth, that was a commonly held belief in antiquity. So the idea that uh, the Book of Enoch says it, so it agrees with the Bible and therefore must be of the same nature as the Bible. Um, again, it's not a logical argument. And verse 18, none of the, uh, sorry, verse 18, uh, conclusion 18, none of the arguments for or against Enoch are conclusive, as in that nails the matter, but that should tell you something. None of the reasons for the book of Enoch prove the book of Enoch. And in fact, as we've seen, when you actually sift through them, there's just nothing of any substance there. There are a load of reasons that are thrown against the wall to see what sticks. But none of them have logical validity. None of them have factual validity, in fact. With the arguments against we have one strong argument against. That argument being that after all those things in the book of parables, it then identifies Enoch as the one who matches uh, the description, which should be Yeshua's description. Description of things which are spoken of in the Tanakh, which should be ascribed to Yeshua, are then ascribed to Enoch. The righteous will dwell with him for eternity and all the other things uh, that I went through at the time. So that is uh, the strongest argument which has been uh, presented. But again, it's not conclusive. I don't speak Ge'ez. Um, I will endeavor to learn Ge'ez to absolutely um, satisfy my mind that that is in fact what it says. I'll learn enough Ge'ez to be able to do that. Um, but it's certainly true that while that huge question is over the book of Enoch as to who it identifies as uh, the son of man who will, um, the righteous will follow his ways and this, that, and the other, nobody should be um, promoting it to anybody as having any kind of validity at all until that question is settled in their own minds. <clears throat> 